Oh, I probably will do that. I've got to say, got it. Yes, absolutely. I've got it, Liz. I've got it. Yeah. <laughs> well, right. it is a greetings and salutations from me. And if you can't tell already, the, there's so much energy between Tara and I at the moment. I am so stoked. You're in for a treat. I'm in for a treat because I feel such a thrill being given this opportunity. Now, Tara is um, a former international football player for England. She was captain of our team for seven years under the manager of Hope Powell, plus many more colleagues. Now she's played at club level for Millwall Lionesses, for Charlton, for Croydon, for Brighton and Hove Albion as well. She played tennis at a regional level and a county level. Is there anything that you haven't done, Tara? This is amazing. And of course, the reason that I know Tara is because she is married to the wonderful, most beautiful Claire, who is one of my travel counsellors. And that's how I've gotten to know you over the many years at conference. And now you run your own business, you run Fit and Fearless, you do kettlebells and you do boot camps and you do boxing sessions. You keep it in there and you are giving back all of the time. Such a fearless and incredible woman. And after the game on Sunday, you know, it's something that Alex Scott said um, and she was like, every single player for England, every single women's football player, every single captain, has got a hand on that trophy because if it wasn't for you paving the way, pioneering, being there, showing up, buying your own kit, driving yourself to places, we wouldn't have the game that we have today. We certainly wouldn't have the coaching or the players that we have today. So we have everything to be grateful for, to you and for those players that have, you know, have a rich tapestry in the history of England women's football. So I want to know, when did you first kick a football? How did you know? What was in you? You know what, Linz? It always goes back to my childhood. And I lived down the street. There was me and my sister. And there must have only been about one other girl down the street. And it was all boys. Wow. Now, you know what it's like. When you've got boys, my sister wasn't interested. She had dolls. I did not ever want to pick up a doll. I think my mum said once, I had one tiny tears. I ripped the head off it and drew over it. So that was the last time... <laughs> And in the end, to be honest with you, it was like, you know, I, I always enjoyed running around. And um, and the boys one day said to me, well, why don't we have a little game of football over the park? Eight years old, probably, eight or nine. And so I went over there, started kicking a ball about. And do you know what, Lynn? Straight away, I loved it. It felt natural. That's the only thing I can say, you know, and it was it was lovely because all the other boys in the end would be like, can we have Tara on our team and and stuff like that? And, and do you know what? And that was it. And uh, literally about six months later, I started playing for a boys team. Wow. Freedom boys. Now, I always remember this because they were such a lovely bunch of lads. And it was so funny because every time we played against opposition, that was all boys. You could see the boys going, is that a girl? Is that a girl? <laughs> is that a girl playing? And it was lovely because they were all like, oh, she probably can't play. But by the end of the game, Linz, they knew I could play. <laughs> I bet they wanted like, you on the team all the time, they did. didn't they? But they were like, come on, Tara, we want you know what they were? After every game we played, it was so funny because I was up front for them and scored a few goals. The boys had come over and the managers had come over to try and poach me. Can you come play for us? But it was lovely. So at that age, they could see that girls could play football. Obviously, it wasn't as many teams as there are now. There's over 9,000 women's tech club, you know, teams now. But back then, it was just like, I just loved it. It felt natural and even at that age, I thought, I oh, know, this is going to be, I wonder if we could ever go and play for England and stuff like that. But, you know, as you go old, you, exactly. At that age, you think, oh, is there a possibility? Yeah. But yeah, that, that is how I got into football. Let's not forget, this is the 70s and the early 80s. This, yeah, this yeah, yes. We're talking raw time here, you know, oh, yeah. the backdrop of all of this is very much what we're experiencing now, which is cost of living crisis. You know, you've got minor strikes, you've got high unemployment and everything else. And then you've got your family around you. What did your family think? Were they just like, oh, Tara's the entire, or this is- Do you know what? It's, it's a good question, that Lindsay. It's a fantastic question because um, a lot of people say to me, well, who in your family plays football then? And I'm like, uh, nobody. Yeah. So you've got any brothers? Said, no, I've got one sister, doesn't like football. Well, what about your, what about your dad? Never asked if your mum plays, it's fun, isn't it? <laughs> um, did, you, did your dad play? No. Got any uncles? Yeah, of course I have. Did they play? No. Cousins? I've got male cousins. Nobody in my football going back, well, years have ever played football. So it was really weird how, you know, because usually if your dad plays or your cousin plays or your uncle, you yeah, got, nobody. Wins. It was purely because I went over the park, played with the boys and, you know, and they loved it and I loved it. And that is how it happened. 
So it, it was as simple as that, but the family were very supportive, Lynn's very, very supportive. I think that makes all the difference as well, doesn't it? Because I think for a young girl growing up through the 70s to play football was quite extraordinary. It was quite, you know, a bit different, a bit like, oh, OK, well, you know, let's go with this. How lucky were you and how much of a fortune was it to have parents and siblings who were like, OK, go on? Because I think I think sometimes during that period, mums and dads especially would have, might have shut it down and said, no, that's not for you. Don't do it. So I think... That is really, really lucky. Who inspired you in the football world? Was there anybody that you could see visibly who lit a fire in your heart and said, yes, I can do that? To be honest, um, it's funny because obviously going back then again, it's, it was like a lot of, obviously TV-wise, men's teams. Yes, um, yes. I've always been a Spurs supporter, so I'm a Tottenham supporter. So for me, it was always Glenn Hoddle. So, you know, when I was watching him play, it was just like, oh, God, yes. You know, and even in the street, Lins, nowadays, girls are going to say, oh, we're playing in the street, and I'm Alex Scott, or, oh, I'm, playing, so, you know, I'm George Stanway. No, that when I was when I was in the street, I was getting other things. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Whereas now, girls are in the street calling themselves after girls' names. I know, I think yeah, it's but, fantastic. It's really great but, when you see it all on social media, you know, in the you see the young girls and they're being interviewed, and which is fantastic. You know, dads have taken their daughters. I saw that over the weekend, and that's incredible as well. And you say, you know, who are you inspired by? And they're listing all of the women on the team. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is yeah. so fantastic. You know, it's no longer, I mean, I'm going back to like Kenny Dalgleish. Oh, a big fan <laughs> of Kenny, big fan of Kenny Dalgleish, yes. Yeah. And all of those people from way back when, and we've got these new, fantastic, fearless superstars. Do you know what? Just thinking about it, questions popped in my head. Yeah. Do you think that social media has played a huge part in this tournament, making it accessible, do you think, for... Uh, young girls and, and women to have more accessibility I think to the players what do you think I think so I think it's been brilliant um, I mean I'm I, I follow um, Frank Kirby and a, a few of the other girls as well and um, oh yeah it's amazing I think it's amazing because now you know and not just that but they answer they answer back they don't just fling out and they it's like, oh my god I've got a response back and it's it's lovely and they, they're so they, they're humble the girls you know what I mean you know at the, you know at the moment I know they're not earning what the men are earning so it's not going to their heads but when you look at these girls I don't think it ever will I don't think it will go to their head even if they do end up earning I mean obviously they can they can live off what they, they earn now but I'm talking mega bucks and that's what we want to see in the future we want to see like we spoke about only about about the tennis the women are now on the same pass I mean that's what we want to see yeah I still think there's a few years to go before that's going to happen because they want bums on seats but, I mean, obviously, you know, the big stadiums, why can't the girls be in the big stadiums like the men? But, you know, that's, that is, yeah, but definitely, I think uh, social me uh, media has been fantastic. It's yeah. coming at that time as well, Lynn. The stars are aligning. You know, now again, we've got this, you know, all the girls can see them and it's like, oh my God, and they're on their phones and the girls are walking down the street. Well, you know, it's just phenomenal. Yeah, I think it's brought the game closer I oh, brought that passion closer and where women and girls you know I speak for myself you know I'm, I'm in my 50s now and I flipping love it I'm obsessed with it I'm obsessed with the team I'm obsessed with the manager I'm obsessed with their training I want to know where they are what they're doing I mean the banter is off the wall and I love how much they all get on because I recognize that something Serena uh, Beekman said which was you know when she took over 10 months ago there was a chat about a change in behaviour and we don't entirely know what that is. So it's open to interpretation, but I would like to think that she's had a little word of, yeah. I know you all play for different teams. I know you're all competitive, but this is one team. You turn up, you show up, no drinking, no eating, no nothing. You know, it's yeah. this team thing because going back to when you were captain under Hope Powell, we never had that social media. We never had the ability to you. We never knew kind of what was going on when and where. What do you think that meant for Serena to have that conversation when you're bringing that team together, when she's talking about behaviour? What do you think it meant? I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I was always, even before, you know, I was named captain, I've always been very professional, me. You know, if we were given kit to wear, my kit would be folded, even if it was dirty kit, it would be folded neatly and given back in a pile that I was given, to, you know, so it's, it's a bit of respect and stuff like that. And that's what she'd want. She'd want respect, not only for themselves, like you said, the drinking and this, that and the other, 
but for each other. You're there to do one job, and that's to win. And more importantly, just to do your best. And when I look at, look at Serena as, 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 as a manager, I am loving the fact that I truly believe that she says to every one of those players, go out there, do your best, have no regrets when you come off that pitch. If you make mistakes, I don't care how many mistakes you make. It's how you react after that. It, you know, if, if you're going for a tackle, OK, you've got a yellow. Don't worry about it. Don't don't chat the referee. Be strong, carry on with your game. And I think that's what she's instilled in them. And you can see it because the camaraderie is absolutely amazing. I know, it's off the wall. It's off the scale, yeah. totally. She's you can see it. Yeah, you can feel it as well. And it's, it's tangible. She's managed to harness this culture that I think every single business wants. You know, they want that culture of togetherness, of harmony, of that behavior, which says, these are the values, you stick with them and you show up. And I'm like, can we just replicate Serena everywhere, please? It's, it's in a belief. That's what she's given them. She's given it in a belief. She's making them play um, their own game. She's picked them for a reason. And that's why she's picked them. She allows them to play in that position that she's picked them for. I like the way you play. I'm picking you. Go and just do that for me on the pitch. And that's all she's asking. But you can tell the girls, they, I mean, they just love each other. And it's not just the 11. That was not just the 11 that played most of the games. That's the back staff. That's the masseuses. That's the, you know, the nutritionists, it's the physio, it's everybody. And it's the subs. They play, and as we know, the subs played a blooming big part in that. Yeah, they are. And, and that's what it's about. You get called off the pitch, even if you've only been on there 40 minutes. You, you get dejected. Of course you do. They come off, they clip the crowd, they hug their teammate and say, go and give it. And that's what you want. There's not individual players. That is a pure team across the board. Oh, I just love it. I love it. Going back to when you were kicking a ball with your team and everything mm. else and you were starting to get noticed, did you feel that there were any blockers? Did you see any blockers? Did you notice that there were any challenges that you thought, oh, hang on a minute, I've not felt this before. Was there anything that stood in your way? To be honest, Lynn, um, football-wise, there was some girls' teams back then. There was some girls' teams, and again, not as many as there are today. But um, mainly, Lynn, it was school. Yeah. I, was, I loved it, and, and I spent most of my um, break times playing football in the playground with the boys. And I have to be honest, I was literally the only girl. A lot of my team you know my, my classmates wanted to play netball or do a little bit of you know rounders but for me it was football they didn't want to join in the only time they ever wanted me to speak to them after time was can I get a date with one of the boys <laughs> I was like, he was he was like oh please I like him can you I'm like he's joining in no I don't want to talk to you then just go <laughs> but, you know, but it was it was the school I mean um I wanted to play in the boys team they wouldn't allow me I mean I was 11 years old physically then we're probably a little bit less than a boy but I'm not tall, as you know, my, my stature is only five foot one or so. Um, and I was quite small. But the the um, ma manager or the uh, coach of the boys team was gutted because he knew, you know, that I could play. And he really wanted me. And he said, Tart, unfortunately, the school won't allow it. And that's all to do with a bit of the government and stuff. You know, you're not allowed to have girls aren't allowed to play. They were allowed me to do it in the playground. They never stopped me, but not in a team situation. And that is what got me. There was no girls football readily available. And I was a bit like to my mum and dad, well, the boys can play why can't we and I, it, that got me down a little bit that really frustrated me so schools definitely and that's got to change that's it's got, got to change. change and I think this is one of the things that has come out of this did you see the open letter that the lionesses made they did, did an open letter to uh Rishi and um Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss yeah. um, all of them signed it and they said you know there there are 63 percent of girls in schools in the UK that have access what about everybody else you know it has to change the level of PE the hours that, that girls can have access to PE not just about hockey netball rounders or what we deem as feminine yes. sports yeah uh, but they get access to things that they really want to be passionate about like football what do you think is going to happen now do you know what I honestly believe that I don't think they've got a chance the government I think they're going to have to do it and I think they will I think if I think if Liz gets in, it's definitely going to happen. I, I I'm really hoping, but I I really do think it will because you can't off the back of that. If it doesn't happen now, when's it going to happen, Liz? To be honest, it needs to happen. It's not fair, and it's not just about able-bodied. It's about other. You know, we we had um, uh, girls with disabilities. You know, that had wheelchairs and stuff when I was there. They can still play. 
they can still get involved. Yeah. So it's going to be across the board. It has to be everybody, all abilities, all genders, everything. Sport equality. It's just equality. Yeah. It's what it comes yeah. down to. Yeah, you're well, absolutely right. I think, yeah, I think there is an element of the government haven't got an option now because I think people are going to vote with their feet. I think people are going to start demanding in okay. schools that there is accessibility to sport for all, no matter the ability, no matter all of that. I think it's incredible because um, I see that, especially there's a friend of mine who works in travel. Her daughter has just signed for Liverpool Fantastic. youth team. and. Fantastic. It's incredible, you know, and I see there's a few people that I know whose daughters are playing football who can now, you know, leapfrog into that because of the platform that has been given because of the spotlight, which is amazing. Was there um was there a narrative back then growing up to play football? You know, the culture, it was very male dominated, you know, and, and things like that. But yeah. what's the narrative? Um to be honest with you, when, when I grew up, there was an England team there, you know, there was around when I was there. And I used to go and watch some of the England games. And that's when I used to sit there thinking, oh, God, I want to put on an England shirt. You know, you do. You like sitting there going, I want to do that. I want to do that. Even back then, you did hear little comments in the crowd, you know, like, mm, should they really be playing? Oh, dear, their hair's very short. Oh, they're, they're, they're quite, they look quite butch. I, I'm just saying it, but these are the comments that you hear. Um, you know, and I'm just thinking, really, why are you just not concentrating on the game? Because the girls can play. There's always been that stigma, you know, it's slightly, and it's always been there. What I like about it a bit more today, you know, that obviously growing up, it was very much like that, is the fact that I've got a lot of male friends, a few that are coming with me to watch the um, America game in October, and they love women's football. They see it for what it is. They see that these girls are talented. They like that. They love the fact that when they're failed, they get straight up. There's no rolling around. Um, they think that they should get paid the same as guys do, and it's changing. It's not. We're never going to change everybody's mind. It's never going to happen because everybody's got their own views. We just want to go with the majority. And the point is, if you don't like women playing football, then don't come to grounds, don't watch them, and don't comment unless it's good. Yeah, but growing yeah. up, it was always a bit like that. You know, it's a bit like, should they really be here? I mean, you're, you're going back to the 1920s when there was 53,000 at Goodison Park, you know, playing, you know, in a crowd of 50. 3,000 watching a women's game and then the following year they ban it for 50 years because it's not really a suitable game for women oh you know this is the you're going back to then and then in the you know then obviously the WFA came in then the FA affiliated with the WFA then a little bit more funding came in but until Sunday's result really on Sunday you know things have really now got to change we've got to that bow on there's two sort. things here I think these are bringing social media back into it. I think the comments that were made in the stands to those on the pitch, I think, you know, not just the women, it's sadly, it's a race thing as well. It that happens and it's disgraceful and it should absolutely be stopped. And I think they're making inroads for homophobia, race, everything else, as well as women's equality. Amen to that and let that continue. And I think what you don't hear on the pitch these days now sadly is taken onto social media and you see some of the comments on there it's a choice they can block and get rid of those and I think yeah there is a, a time and a place for it but you just comment on that and I think also picking up on what you said you were taking some male friends and they see the gold in the game male allyship we can't do it without us guys because me and you before we started recording yes. Listen to this. Tara and I, we were chat, 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 chat. We were like, best press record here. Otherwise, we're going to be chatting all day. But we started talking about Ian Wright and the whole effort around lifting these women up and getting behind them and championing them and really lifting the conversation to a different level from a male perspective. Share again with me, if you will, your thoughts on Ian Wright and how good he's doing and why we need more people globally. Well, I adore him, right? I mean, I know I'm a Spurs supporter and he's an Arsenal player, but do you know what? He is, uh, he just adores women's football, true advocate for it. Now, he used to play at Arsenal. We all know that Alex Scott used to play at Arsenal and they're very good friends. He's seen it firsthand. He's, he was at the training grounds when these girls are training. He knows how good these girls are. And to have somebody, like you said, as an ally, a male ally, to go out there and literally say to the government, you need, you know, and the FA, you need to change all this. You know, that is what we need. And globally, you know, it'd be lovely for David Beckham to come out a little bit more and say things like that. Or Ronaldo out in Portugal. Big, massive players in different countries do it across the world globally. 
that is what we need. And we need more people like Ian Mike, because he, I tell you what, I think every woman in this country is in love with him. No, I certainly am. <laughs> certainly am. I was already, but now even more so. He He's was amazing. Was- He really is amazing and he's made some fantastic comments. Uh, You know, I've seen different quotes coming out and different memes and things like that. You know, you couldn't wish for a better male ambassador for football than him, really, because he has been quite vocal over the tournament. I really was surprised that Beckham was not at the game on Sunday. I thought that he might have showed up, you know, so I was a bit like... Yeah, I can. I agree. I thought he might have been because obviously his daughter Harper likes a little bit of football, so I was hoping he'd be there. But um, yeah, going back to Ian Wright, he's just amazing. Um, I read an article, I think, yesterday. He mentioned something about Beth Mead. She's sponsored by a local, I think, is it Camden something, some form of like beer. And he's now saying to him, well, if you're using a name and you're using it, you've got to pay her. So he's, you know, all these sponsorships now, they've got to get on these girls and sponsor them and then put them on TV so people can, I just think it's just... And I think Ian Wright's going to become um, a sports agent for them all and he's going to be like, right, come on, commercial, get in, what we do. Too right. Yeah. And do you know what, if you do that, you yeah. love it. Every wife is street, wouldn't it? He gets it reminds, me, reminds me of Jerry Maguire when he's like, show me the money. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, he's, he, he, do you know what? He is just an amazing human being. You yeah. know, he's, he's got... He's, I mean, I remember watching a, um, a programme about him when he had the um, the guys, you know, the the, um, the jailers, when he did all that with them and everything. And, ah, oh, he don't care. He goes out there. Football is football. Doesn't yeah. matter who you are, what you've done, this, that, and the other, what your gender is, your race, anything. He is just solely behind it. And, oh, we need more people like him, Lindsay. I know, he's fantastic. So- I tell you who lit a little uh, fire in my heart was young Tess, the young fan who yeah. was spotted in the... Um, in the Sweden game and she was dancing away and they they found her they put her on morning tv Gabby got hold of her they got the tickets did you see the interview that they did oh, it was fantastic it was brilliant and, and then they gave her the shirt didn't they they gave her the shirt I think it was, was it whose shirt was it they gave? it was a Russo yeah. shirt and unless you Russo didn't she she uh she had a little t- yeah I think it's amazing and that's that going to be played on the wall about. oh and this is it it made me so emotional to feel that it's not only her, there are other young girls exactly like Tess who are enamoured with the game. They're so in love with it. And you can tell oh, it, it just absolutely... It was amazing, wasn't it? Yeah, it really and was. Do you not please me as well, Lynn? Do you not please me more as well? Was the fact that when you looked in them standing, you were at the game. So you probably saw it, sweetheart. You probably saw it. I was down with my sisters at the time. And um, it was seeing all the little boys as well. Yeah. Generation growing up. Mm-hmm. Now thinking girls can play football, whereas in my, it was like, oh yeah, you know, my first things when I was playing my opponents, just, they've got to go on there, baby, she won't be able to play. <laughs> now, girl, now boys are going to be going, yeah, girls can play. Yeah. And they're, yeah. you know, and this is brilliant. Absolutely It's a brilliant. different narrative that's being fed through now, isn't it? This is what so, we want. Yeah. This is what we want. Exactly. Yeah. Feel good, feel good factor on Sunday. Totally. Great totally. to see. Oh, but you yeah. loved it, didn't you? Yeah. Oh, it was just, the noise was incredible. Every time that the noise was insane, I'll never forget that. But Tara, tell me about your break into club football and then on to internationally playing football. What was that like? Oh, it was. Um, I mean, How did I you started. Started? well, to be honest with you, um, I played for Beedon Boys, and then my mum said, "Well, look, you know, why don't you go into a girls' team?" And I was playing for a little girls' team called Oxford United at the time. Not that it was based in Oxford; they were just called Oxford. And we went to Greenwich, went down to Greenwich. And I love Greenwich anyway. And we went to Greenwich Baths and they had a tournament down there, five a side. And we entered it and I looked at the thing and I went, oh, me all I misses. And I'd heard they were a good team. And we actually played against them. And I think we lost about 3-2 to or something like that. But they spotted me there. And afterwards, I didn't know at the time, but while I was playing, one of the, um, one of the managers went up to my mum because they obviously realised my mum was cheering me on and everything. And they said, you, you know, t- she said, yeah, my mum should... She fancy coming along to a little trial at Millwall. And when I come off, I was like, oh yeah, here we go. So straight away, literally the following week, we were down there and, and I had a little trial and I joined, ended up joining Millwall when I was about 10 or 11. And at Millwall at that time was the likes of Hope Powell and Brenda Sampari and all the big guns. And you don't get a much better player ever than Hope Powell in, oh, I'll tell you what, amazing player. One of the best I've ever played with. And, and to grow up playing with them for three or four years was fantastic. But then, Linz, I started to play tennis at school. Ooh. And within, exactly, and within six months of picking up a tennis racket, it um, entered me into the Kent under-12s, and I won it. 
the tennis. And I'd only just been, I was playing against kids that have been playing since they were six. So wow. I was quite good at tennis. Then came the peer pressure. Money in tennis. Lynn's is always no money in football. Yeah. What do you do? I was sponsored at tennis, so I didn't have to pay for any of my travel, any of my rackets, any of my kit. But football, money, because you had to take me to, you know what I mean? So it's different. So a bit of peer pressure, I had to give up football. The love of my life I had to give up when I was about 14 years old. And I was, Lynn's, I was gutted. I bet you were. Played tennis, I was, babe, honestly, I was gutted. So it went on for two years. So I was playing both sports. It just came to the, I couldn't do it anymore. So I chose tennis reluctantly. Um, and then literally, Linz, I was on that tennis court, just knocking up with my coach one day when I was about 16 years old. I said, I really don't want to do this anymore. I'm really sorry. Um, I, I said, I can't play it. I want to be in a team. I am a team person, not individual. And it's lonely playing tennis, doing, you know, singles here. The mixed doubles, the doubles was great, but it was lonely. Um, but funny enough, I didn't kick a football from when I gave up at 14. And I didn't kick a football ever again until I was 20. So for six years, Linz, that time when you're coached and you're moulded and stuff like that, I didn't kick a football. And the only reason I did that was because my mum said to me, you need to get out. There's a local team in Maidstone, because I've moved to Maidstone, called the Tigresses, not Lionesses, but Tigresses. Get along there and play. Went for trial, got in there, met Claire. So this is going back over 30 odd years ago. Wow. Claire used to play as well um, from, um, from Maidstone. And then from then on, we, we got the promotion the next year and went up into the premiership with the big guns, Lynn. So you had your Arsenals, you had your Donny Bells, Liverpools. And it was like, oh, my God, this is a different kettle of fish. The standard, because they had obviously England players in there at the moment, we didn't, was incredible. I thought I was fit, Lynn. I thought I was fit. No. <laughs> I was blowing out my backside <laughs> trying to play against these players, thinking this is the standard that I need to be if I want to progress, fulfil childhood dream playing international level I knew I had to do something so I took myself away I did extra training and stuff like that got picked for the region was spotted by a lovely lady called Julie Hemsley who used to coach at Brighton and Hove and was also an England player she then spoke to Ted Copeland who was the um, manager at the time for Hope and said look this girl's pretty good give her a trial and at the time I had to choose between going to play for the all Lionesses Either Arsenal wanted me to go and join them. Now, Arsenal were a big team. They offered me a boot, boots, free boots, free travel, anything I wanted, training up at the um, Arsenal ground, the Highbury back then as they used to, or play for this team called Croydon, who I'd never heard of. I'd heard of Croydon, didn't even know they had a female team. But when you've got the likes of Brenda Sampar and Hope Powell that play for Croydon, who I knew as a kid, that is what swayed me. I didn't want the adulation that all the Arsenal players would get in because they'd won everything. I went to a team that had won nothing, that would only been together for two or three years, you know, come fourth or fifth in the premiership the year before. I thought, I don't care about that. I want to play football that I love. So I joined Croydon. And the following year, we won the FA Cup and we won the premiership. So I was like, I picked the right team. Yeah, it was amazing. Absolutely amazing. And then from there, internationally, I was picked in 1995 and my first game wins was against Croatia. And I come on as a sub and who did they drag off? Who was having the game of a life? Hope Pal. And oh she was, you could tell by her face, Lynn, she was like, what the hell are they bringing me off for? And then she saw it was me and she was like, that's all right for me. Come here, Taz, give it, you know, go out and do your bit. And we, I think we won five mil, but, and that's when I got my first catch for, um, for England in 1995. Yeah. Oh my good grief. So, so Hope, played with you when yes. it was the England side so she then became manager did you stay in the team while she became no. manager or did she kind of go did you part ways what happened there I've always been close to her we've always had a great relationship um and um when I was at England like I spoke to you earlier again pre this um recorded thing we we were talking about um managers and, and I was saying to you about how they let you play has Serena lets the play has Serena lets the players play their own game um I, I got chosen for England because I was a forward. I was a striker um, or I liked centre midfield. I wasn't a winger. And when you're a winger, it puts you in a position. It's like playing John Terry, who was a defender. It's like playing him up front. You're putting somebody out of it. And to be honest with you, I fell a bit out of love with it. I was playing different positions and I was playing under Ted Copeland at the time. And I was a bit like, do you know what? I'm not enjoying my football. Yeah. And I don't know why, Linz, but I'm one of these people, it's, you know, and I was very reluctant because there's nothing better 
than putting on an England shirt. And I did think to myself then, I hope I don't regret this, but I wasn't enjoying it. And so I backed away for a couple of years. And, and you know, a period of time when I could have got a lot more caps. And I did retire earlier than I should have done, as I, I know that. But then we went up to Newcastle when I was playing for Croydon and we had this cup game. And we won about five or six nil. I think I'd scored four, four goals. And I get a phone call and I look down and it's Hope. I'm like, oh no, because I know she's England manager. What well, better take this? Oh, I hope we are you. She said, yeah, Taz. She goes, get your backside, she said, along to the England camp. You're going out to France with us. Go into work tomorrow and tell them that you're picked to go. At the time, this is what we all want to talk about, about how it's changed nowadays, mm. is I had to go into work the next day, Linz, and I knew, well, knew, I didn't have any annual leave left. And the company that I worked for at the time was a catering company. Before I moved on and became, um, went into my school and did manager stuff there, I worked for a catering company. They didn't have the money to say to me, yeah, take a few days paid. I had to pay for my country. They said, you can go. And I was lucky they even let me go, to be honest. But I had to take it three or four days unpaid leave. So at the end of the month, I'm putting on an England shirt, paying for my country and having to, all I got was petrol money to the ground. And then we just flew out to France from there. And that's all we got. So, you know, that is pride. to put an England shirt, knowing that you're going to get nothing for it and you're going to be out of pocket. And that's bad. I know, that's how bad it was back then. So the difference, oh my gosh, I'm still trying to get my head around all of this because it's moved on a lot. And I know that the, the players for the England squad this time around, they do get paid nowhere near, nowhere near the same as the men's game I know that but of course they get paid now to do the job that they do we're not talking a great space of time in between when you played for England and today that's not a huge amount of time so and it's only really just been recent hasn't it that they've started to pay really for exactly the girls gosh it's just enormous you know to think that this is absolutely for pride you have paid your own way had oh, totally. a job you know it, oh somebody said it I don't know who was commentating at the t- who was the commentator at the England game on Sunday and she said you know all the women who have played for England over the years who've been um fire officers police officers teachers was it Rachel Brown Phillips I think it might have been yeah and I was like do you know what damn right because the men have not been doing that at all for no. since God was a boy. No, no? Yeah. still have to to have your day job. So oh, totally, yeah. My, my hope is that everything starts just now. Oh, hundred percent. Word. Yeah. So how was Hope different as a manager towards playing for her? Because she obviously chose you to be captain. What she did. Captain? She did. Yeah, I, I. She chose me as captain with um. I think it was the European Championships in, in, in 19, 2001 it was against, and we ran Germany. Germany was going to be the next game. And we'd never beaten Germany. I mean, back then they were, I mean, they, well, the money they had ploughed into their game was a lot more than what we had. So and they trained a lot more, they had more than we did and stuff like that. And, and Hope just said to me, she called me aside after the training session. I'll always remember it, clear as day. I said, I need to speak to you after training. I said, yeah, no problem. Didn't think anything of it. And she pulled me aside and she says, I want you to captain the side against Germany. He says, how do you feel about it? I felt I'd known hope for years. So I think she did know how I am as a person. Mm-hmm. And she said to me, you are so good with the youngsters. He goes, you've got this ability to make them feel at ease. If they make mistakes, it doesn't matter. Do you know what I mean? And stuff like that. And it was, it was probably the one that it was the proudest moment of, of my life. Um, I mean, my only thing is the fact that I should have played on longer than I did. I mean, obviously, I had a knee injury that, that took me out um, a little bit. And then obviously, you know, other things happened, like personally, like with my mum and stuff. So it was very difficult. But to be given that and to go out there was amazing, Linz. I can't explain it. It was just the best thing ever. Singing the National Anthem, Linz. I always do. <laughs> I, w- I mean, we all stood on Sunday yeah. and we all got quite emotional about it because you could you know you could feel it you could actually yeah. feel it it that's what it was but I think you know that to give you the just desserts that you do you're incredible you're an incredible human you did so much for women's football absolutely you did and your captaincy and I know you said that you know you should have gone on and done a lot yeah. more. I'm just hoping that your 
you're enjoying all of this yes. success and you're breathing oh, it. I am. You deserve to have that, you know. Um, as a captain, Leo Williamson, of course, as well. Great job. Absolutely. Yes. Well, love and it comes with a, a bit of pressure as well. And, you know, Hope knew you from playing. She knew your intricacies. She knew mm -hmm. your reactions. She knew how you would play. What do you think that Leah would have gone through in that tournament to be captain of England women's football? I, I, I think really, I mean, obviously she's, um, she, Serena's obviously picked up because she sees, she obviously sees these little, you know, things, oh, she bonds well. You can tell that she bonds well with the players. You need that. As a captain, you have to be open, approachable, because sometimes the players might have issues they're not they're worried about something. They don't feel they can, although I, I bet they could, could go straight to the manager because she's so approachable. Um, and, you know, but it's good to have that. She, they know that, you know, they all know that she's got their backs. Um, yes, she would have been nervous. She'd have been, boosted the girls up in the changing room. I bet there was music blaring out beforehand. Um, she would have just asked them to go out and enjoy the game. And more importantly, she probably would have said, there's never, ever just one captain on that pitch. There's 11. And there's more of them sitting on the bench. You've all got to... You've all just got to rise up. Do you know what I mean? Because there were times when Leah's got the ball and, and somebody might say to her, do this, do that and everything. And you just got to be. But I think, oh, yeah, I think she'd have loved it. And I think putting faith in, in I mean, she's only 25. And to have that in the first tournament ever to be her. You know I, mean? I mean, come on. She's got, a, she's got a good future. They've all got magnificent futures ahead of them. Um, especially if she can keep them together and they just yeah. grow. Yeah, I was... Um... Like I said, I'm obsessed. I'm listening to all the yeah, yeah. And things. You know, I was listening to um, Jill Scott's podcast on Radio 2. And she was saying that Mary, uh, the uh, goalie, she nearly walked away from the game a couple of years ago. She nearly walked away. And I was like, oh, my God, thank God that she didn't. You know, these yeah. are incredibly talented women who, for one reason or another, were on the verge of either not doing it or walking away or doing something completely different. So let's talk about um, the game on Sunday because legacy is this word oh. that just gets banded around. Yeah. And, you know, I talked about it on Tuesday. I hosted a barbecue night in London somewhere and I talked about legacy and what yeah. that was because the win, it wasn't just the win. It was bigger than that. It was much yeah. more huge than that. What do you think about how we should now capitalise on this golden moment? What do we need to do now? I think we need to put, um, get more bums on seats. And that means going to bigger stadiums. Yes. It means to go to bigger stadiums. So when Liverpool have got a game, yeah, the girls can play there. Chelsea have got a game. Spurs have got a game. You've got to do it. You've got to get bums on seats. Because it's all, at the end of the day, Linz, what's it about? I don't care what people say. It's about money. Media coverage is fab. I think media coverage is good. I think we still obviously need to do more, a little bit more. But, you know, it's much better than what it was. I mean, we hardly had anything back then, to be honest with you. Mm. But it's, you know, and it's, it's not just about um, women's football. It's about all sports. If you look at it now, sponsorships. We need to, there needs to be sponsors out there jumping on. Frank Kirby sponsored by Nike. Um, you know, other players are sponsored. And, and that's where it needs to go. Players need to be sponsored. They need to be earning enough money to, to live. I'm not, you know, the higher rated players are, but I'm talking about those in sometimes the lower leagues as well. Because there's lower league men's teams that can still live off of it. They're not elite or like professional. These days, you know, and this is what we need to do, Lindsay. It comes on seats, media coverage. It's getting them sponsored, getting their faces on the TV, getting schools, allowing girls to play football, getting elite players from you know, from big clubs to go in and coach the girls in schools. That's what we need. We need to just, well, just go. Everything. Okay. Everything. <laughs> we do. We do. do. You know, Cara, years and years and years ago, I'm going back now to oh, mid-90s, actually. I went to watch a, um, an Eng um, it might not have been England, it was a women's game. It might have been Man U women's game. And when you think about the disparity in crowd numbers, back mm. then, it was like half the pitch. Okay. You know, it, it was just that half. That was it, you know, and it was just families and friends of and whoever. And I heard the games have sold out for USA. And is it Luxembourg yeah. as well? Luxembourg, that, Luxembourg, yeah. Luxembourg, yeah. Can't, can't get a ticket for love nor money. You know, that is it's the got momentum. Yeah. It's momentum now. Momentum's key. 
we've got to keep it going. It can't be a lull, just keep it going. That's what we've got to do. And, you know, in the, and this is where I think the big clubs to start with, like your Liverpools, like you were saying, the Liverpools and the, the Spurs and stuff like that, they need to make it look like when, we want them, when the girls are on TV, they need to get the blokes with them. So when the girls are having chats and stuff like that, they can see them speaking. It's like the counterparts. It's like, yeah, this is going somewhere. You know, and if the girls are training, have a few of like the male, you know, like, for example, I don't know, Harry Kane at Tottenham, have him standing there, that into a few of the girls watching them play. This is what you need. You do need, going back to, as you said, you need their male allies and you need to keep that ball rolling. It's all about momentum now, Lynn. You've just got to keep it going. World Cup's coming up. We need to keep I going. I can't wait. It's going to be great. I can't wait. <laughs> I'm so excited. I know. I'm excited too. It's brilliant. So this yes. World Legacy, what does it mean for you, having played for your country, having worn that shirt, having seen the result on Sunday and knowing how that feels? What does that word mean for Tara? Legacy for me, do you know what? Coming what I've come, you know, not just me, but every single player that's ever put on a, a shirt. I'm talking my era. I'm talking generations before. We, you know, I've been liaising with some people on, and, and it's just amazing for us. It's like we've been the foundations and I just want them foundations to keep building. I want to see that all our hard work, the sacrifices on and off the pitch, that's the important things and not just mine. We were talking previously as well about family. Mm. You know, it wasn't just about me. I would not have been able to fulfill my destiny and my dream if it wasn't for my mum taking me all over the country. Mm. If my sister followed me, or even sometimes when my sister didn't want to go, the sacrifice of my dad that would stay behind and look after my sister while my mum took me. It's all about that. And it's about families getting behind these players and their loved ones. And it's, it's, you know, it's giving them a chance. Every young player, again, like we said, doesn't matter what gender you are, what race you are, giving them a chance mm -hmm. to fulfil something in their life. Whether they want to play elite, whether they want to be professional and get paid, whether they just want to do it as an amateur, to get girls out there playing football, that's all I want. That's it. My, my it next question to you, and I think I know the answer to this, yeah. is how excited are you for the future of women's Oh, sport? my God. <laughs> I'm like you, Linz. I'm like you. And, I, and that's why I love you. You're one of the loveliest people I've ever known. And me and Claire often, even though we don't see you a lot, we often talk, we talk about you. You're gorgeous. And um, I, I love you because you've got the same kind of zest for life. You're a very positive person. Life's too short. You've got to go out there. And for me, I think the future is just amazing. I really, really hope that we come back here in 10 years' time, Linz, and we're having this conversation and these girls are driving around in Bentleys, not just driving around, <laughs> not just driving around but they're driving around in Bentleys, you know, and there's more girls putting on an England shirt, you know, at younger levels, that grassroots keeps building and the, the opportunities are out there for women as there are for the guys. And, um, but I think women's football now is going to be, if we keep on going with momentum, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be Globally, yeah. we're going to take over. We're just going to take over the world, Linz. Simple as that. Why not? And why not? We'll have I a mean, 87,000, Linz. 87,000. 17.4 million watching on TV. More than a platinum jubilee. Come on. It's just That says something. It says a lot, doesn't it? It does. I'm so proud and honoured to have worn an England shirt, to see the girls playing today. I'm proud of every single girl, not just that's put on an England shirt, but that's put on any football shirt. Whether it's, you know, nowadays, you know, whether it's playing for the local little clubs, a bit, whatever, I don't care. Good on you. Get out there. And you're never too old. Anybody's never too old to get on a shirt, go out there and enjoy yourself. Oh, do you know what, everyone? Tara and I were talking about this before we pressed record, which was, you know, I'm in my 50s now and I want to go out and pick a ball up and kick it around. I want to know what that feels like. I want to I want to just go and have a game of football with my family somewhere just to start. And I think it has lit a fire in a lot of people. You know, that there are, you know, older women who perhaps want to go and join a local club. You know, we just at, at the one down the road at the community centre, go and play five a side with some women at work or whatever. You know, the encouragement is there. I felt that Sunday gave permission to anybody, more so women and young yes. girls, to get out and pick up a ball and start kicking it yes. and start having an enjoyment in the game. But I said to Jenny, um, who's our local team? Shall we go? Because I want to yeah. be in. Jenny should go. Should go? Oh, yeah. And I live and quite close good. to Charlton. So maybe. Do you? Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. So maybe I'll Brilliant. get. Yeah, because yeah, that's, where, that's where I got my first cat, the yeah, Valley. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. And I'll so have, have a painted cheek going, Tara was here. I'm yeah. here for Tara. <laughs> exactly. But you're right though, Lynn. It's 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 oh, I just want it to become accessible for everybody. That's yeah. all I yeah. want. Yeah. You know, yeah. and you know, obviously the funding, the funding's a big thing. They need to put their hands in their pockets, the FA, you know, and, and if we would do want to. You know, we're eighth at the moment in the world, but if you want that number one spot and to kick the USA off that number one, we need to, you know, because you can see we've got the talent. You can see we've got the manage, managers in place. All it needs is funding, you know, and yeah, extend the manager for, to at least 10 years. She's got, she's got to be working with us for at least 10 years. Fabulous. I, I think it's a must. I think everybody wants Serena to stay because yeah. she's quite much oh, yeah. what she's managed yeah. to create. So do you think you'll get to meet her? Because I know that we were talking previously and you said that sometimes you get invited to go and chat to the players and have a walk around the stadium, have a walk around the pitch and stuff. What do you I think? don't know. I hope so. I hope we do. I hope we do. Um, I mean, obviously, we've now I think we've been invited to the USA game now even though I've already booked tickets. Um, but um, hopefully, hopefully we'll get to see him afterwards and, and, and go and meet him, fingers crossed. But, you know, I wish him all the luck. I really do. And yeah. for anybody that ever plays it or wants to play it, as you said, that's all we ever want now is just to be on an equal, you know, why shouldn't it be? A playing field, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'd never have a, a problem if boys suddenly went, oh, I want to play netball. Would it bother us? Would it bother us girls? No, let them do it. It should be an even, you know, same with golf, rugby, you know, anything, girls should be able to play whatever sports they like and boys play what they want. It's, you know, it should be equal. And that's all we oh, ever want. They've managed to what? do that in hockey, haven't they? Because they've got yes. men's and women's teams now for England hockey. So Exactly. Yeah, and the golfers, the golfers get paid now quite good money. You know, female golfers. Rugby. Yeah, I was watching girls rugby the other day and I was like, what if I was younger? I can't like, look at that. <laughs> but obviously now I'm like you, Lynn, so I'm 50 odd. I'm like, oh, you know. But you know what? Even It's even made me want to pick up a football and kick it again. No, I think it's brilliant. I think when you get the opportunity to speak to the squad, will you mm. give them our love and our best and say thank you for what they're doing for? Of course, yeah, definitely. Everybody for sport, yes. for equality for sport, and more so for the younger and the older yes. um, ones of us who just yes. want to. They, they've lit a fire in our hearts that we yeah. want to pick up a ball and go kick it around. So please let them know that they are. They're, inf they're influencing many people across the globe for sure because their culture, their attitude, their everything, their pride, the complete joy that yeah. they've brought to so many people, you can't buy that. And I no. think one thing they're inspirational, Lynn. They're absolutely inspirational. Yeah, but it great, couldn't, have happened, couldn't have happened without you, your team, your all of the players that were around yeah. at the time and those that have gone before and after and during. So, yeah. Fantastic. Brilliant. So what's next for you, Tara? What are you going to be doing? Um, Travelling, Linda. <laughs> actually, I'm going to Norway, actually, next week. So we're going kayaking. Wow. Um, yeah, Norwegian fjords. Um, but for me, just to stay happy. Stay happy, enjoy my job. Obviously, my, my, you know, my fitness job. Um, and, yeah, just stay happy. Um, eat, socialise with friends. Go to the theatre more. That, that is just it, really, Linz. Just stay oh, happy and, and stay healthy and... And keep watch, going to more WSL games, everybody. Come on, keep going. Um, and going to see Brighton and Hove. I've already warned Hope. I'll be down there bringing some few friends <laughs> next season. Um, yeah, and just my local hours for girls. Going to go down and see them. So, yeah, just watch a bit more girls football and Dorking Wanderers as well. I'll go and see them. Callum Best, I think, is involved in that. So, wow. um, yeah, so I was speaking to Callum a few weeks back when I went to see uh, Dorking play. And he's, he's, he loves it. He's like Ian Wright. He's just like Ian Wright. He speaks wow so highly and that's another person that's why they're doing well because as we said the Mal yes the allies he absolutely yeah. adores them he's in there he's working hard for them and yeah they're going to do well Dorking they're going to attract a lot of players so yeah so, so we've got Brighton, Brighton Hoven yeah. Albion, Brighton yeah. Albion we've got Dorking Dorking yeah Dorking Wanderers ladies yeah who else and, and watch? I'm going to go and see Arsenal play I want to go and see Arsenal and Chelsea uh, Manchester's obviously a bit too far but but when they come down I'll try and get the good games like the Chelsea the Manchester but yeah everybody I don't mind they're all good they're all good otherwise they wouldn't be there yeah absolutely Tara exactly. thank you so so much for your I've time thoroughly today. enjoyed it you are an absolute credit to yourself and the game and to Claire exactly. I think it's amazing what you've achieved and you deserve your share of this success and to just shine in all of its glory and all those feelings that come with it so yeah it's thank you darling it's been an absolute honor okay so you know, you've been superb 
<laughs> thank you. Stay on the line. I'm just going to end the recording. Stay on. No right, worries. Okay. So thank you.